every year in the United States, between 80 to 100,000 Americans will acquire an MRSA or MRSA infection while visiting or using a hair care facility. Not only that, approximately 15 to 18,000 of them will die. So that makes MRSA or MRSA one of the top hair care associated infections in the United States. Even further, if you caught yourself at home and you crash your skin, and that happens to get infected, there is a very good chance that the pathogen producing that infection in your house happens to be MRSA. Why? Because it's one of the top three skin and soft tissue infection pathogens in the United States today. So it's very clear to us that this particular pathogen is one of the most important public health pathogens of concern right now in the United States. And when I talk about MRSA, one of the first questions I get from the people is, what is MRSA? What is MRSA? Basically, it stands for metacillin resistant staph virus. But before I explain why we need to be aware and concerned about these guys, I need to give them a step back and explain what is the Staphylococcus aureus, what is staph virus. And it's just basically a regular bacteria that is part of your normal flora. Around 30% of the population in the United States have it. So if I sample all of you in this room, probably one third of you will have a staph virus on you. As long as you are healthy and you're not immunocompromised, your defenses are right, there is not going to be a problem for you. But if you happen to be weak, you cut yourself after surgery, then this opportunistic pathogen can definitely produce an infection that it can go from something mild to life-threatening, as I mentioned before. We lose a lot of people every year because of this type of infections. If you get infected, not a problem. A human doctor, even in the animal side, a veterinary doctor, most likely will use some kind of beta-lactamic drug to deal with those infections. And most likely it's going to be penicillin, amoxicillin, ampicillin, or any of the cephalosporins. Under normal circumstances, those antibiotics will do their work and that infection will go away. But if you are the unlucky one, that you acquire one of those strains of staph virus that acquire one gene, and one gene only that we call it the MECA gene, that's the technical name, any staph virus that acquires the MECA gene becomes automatically resistant to all beta-lactamic drugs at once. So the number one choice that human doctors or veterinary doctors have to deal with staph infections go out of the door. So that's one of the biggest problems we have with MRSA. Typical question I get is what I need to be worried about that. The reason that we talk about this is if you are colonized by MRSA, you are 3.6 times more likely to develop an MRSA infection in the next three to four years window. Especially even more if you have one of the risk factors like a surgery or diabetes or something like that. When I say 3.6 times more likely to my mother, to my relative, even to my students, that doesn't really exemplify the risk that means for you to be colonized. So the example that I use for them is this. This is a study done by a bunch of clever researchers, other than me, that they work with the military personnel, and they basically got around 3,000 some recruits that were coming from basic training. We know that in the general population, about 2% of us have MRSA in our nose. In this particular population was around 3 to 4% of them. Okay, they know that they come with some MRSA colonized individuals, and then they go through the 16 weeks long grueling training that they have a lot of cuts and bruises, and, bruises and, and you know, sharing showers and towels and all personal items, crowding conditions, the worst hygiene things that you can think, imagine. So it's no surprise that they expect out of those 3,000 or something soldiers, many of them will come with MERS infections at the end of the training, which exactly was the case. Many of them came with some abscess produced by MRSA. But interestingly, 97% of all the infections in that personnel came from one unique clone that was brought in by those people that were colonized. Not only that, the majority of the people that got infected were those that were already colonized by the time they arrived on camp. So that really show that you don't want to be colonized because your risk of getting infected in the wrong conditions increase, but also you become the source to others. So that definitely explains much better than the 3.6 times more likely for you to be colonize. Now the question always comes is, why are veterinarians working with MRSA? It's not that a human pathogen? Yes, it is. But to answer that question, I normally have to share a secret with you, okay? And the secret is that sadly but truly, pet owners and those that work with animals or companion animals, sometimes they share more than just love with them. <laughs> their behavior exposes their animals to the floras that they have. 
So by doing so, they will acquire also whatever that person has. So you have MRSA on you, guess what? You will pass that to your pet or to your recreational animal. And the problem is that they eventually will develop also MRSA infections. And what do you do if your dog or cat gets sick? You come to me. You come to the veterinarians. And that's how we start to see MRSA coming into our facilities. And that's how my research with MRSA started in 2005 when I started my tenure here in Ohio State. And the research was basically, it started with rumors in the aisles in which colleagues and, and faculty and students tell me that they start to see more frequently MRSA coming to the veterinary medical center. In the past, the MRSA in animals was a no issue. But then starting in 2005, as the prevalence in the human side start to increase, we start to see an spillover effect from the animal side to the human side, and we start to see more cases, dogs and cats and other animals coming into the hospital carrying MRSA. Now, the concern at that time for us was, okay, we know that we have more patients coming in. The question is, are they contaminated in the environment? Are we exposing our personnel, our students, our clients, as well as our patients? And that's where it came in. So we went ahead and sampled, uh, starting in 2006, all the way until more recently, over nine years on a regular basis, we sampled the environment, incoming patients, and more recently, our personnel. And no surprise, we found MRSA in 12% of the surfaces as an average through the years. So no surprise, because we know we're having these cases coming in, we know that they will pass it to the environment, and when MRSA or staff virus get into the environment, they can survive there to two, three, four months, or even more. Then that definitely was something that we expected to see, but not in that percentage. Then the administrators at the time asked me, okay, Armando, are we at higher risk than everybody else? Is that an expected prevalence or baseline for us? So what we did is we went and sampled a human hospital. So we did the same kind of surveillance for a year, monthly sampling, and no surprise, we found that have double of the amount of contamination in the environment. As a matter of fact, at some particular months of the years, we can find up to 40% of the surfaces contaminated by MRSA. Expected, they receive hundreds of thousands of MRSA infected individuals and patients coming to the hospital, so no surprise that you're going to find in the environment on a regular basis. And the question I was at that time was, okay, what about the healthcare facilities that they don't necessarily deal with that type of infectious uh, persons or patients? So we went and sampled for a year at children's hospitals. No surprise, we also find MRSA in the environment, happily in a very low amount of that time. We went to an eye clinic, a year-long surveillance, and we also found MRSA circulating out there. Different kind of ecology and epidemiology, but it still was there. Then we sampled the ambulances across the state of Ohio. So we worked with the Ohio Department of Health, and we went to all the emergency management system across the state, and we sampled the ambulances. And we found out that around 10% of the surfaces were contaminated. The most important thing, though, was that 50%, half of the ambulances, have at least one surface contaminated by MRSA. And then what about public transportation that serves these type of healthcare facilities? And then, no surprise, it's used by thousands of people. Then we also found MERS out there, and roughly around 65% of the buses were contaminated with at least one surface. The funny story here is every time in the past that we used public transportation, as soon as we got out of the metro, the subway, or the bus, my wife will reach to her purse, get a little bit of alcohol gel bottle, and use it, and then pass it to me, and I'm like, eh, ah, nah. That doesn't matter until I did this research. And then once I saw the data, I received, give it to me, the bottle. And then I am the one asking for it because I recognize that it definitely is what we consider a high risk environment. Normally, the people ask me at that time, OK, so is MRSA everywhere? And the answer is no. We have done also research going to we sampled most of the pet stores across the uh, Columbus. We also went to shelters. We went to households across central Ohio, and we couldn't find MRSA there. So we know now today, based on my research and research of many others, that they are what we consider high-risk environments environments where you can easily find MRSA in the environment and very low risk environments where MRSA barely circulated. So that's something very important to keep in mind. Then the next question I get, where do I get it and what can I do to protect myself? Well, you can get it even today just by shaking hands with somebody that is contaminated or colonized, you can acquire it that way. But most likely you will acquire it when you visit or use one of these high risk environments. How many of you recognize this? This is a terrifying elevator button, okay? 
Yes, it is terrifying because this is one of the most common contaminated surfaces in a healthcare environment. It's touched by thousands of people, many of them patients that are infected themselves, and then they will leave it behind for everybody else to touch. So definitely it is there. As a matter of fact, in our research, we have found out that around 30% of the time, the elevator buttons are positive. And it's not that the hospitals or the healthcare setting is not doing their job. They are. But you can picture that it's logistically, physically, and economically impossible to keep it all the time free of these hospital associated pathogens. Why? So let's do this as an example. I am the hospital administrator, and I hire somebody that the only job is going to be clean and disinfect the hospital elevator buttons. So this person came in very efficiently, spray the chlorexine or peroxide, clean and disinfected, no MRSA. But there are 20 elevators with multiple floors. So that person has to move to the next one. And guess what? As soon as that happened, Armando comes around with Emerson saying his hand on his nose, touch it, leave it behind for the thousands of people that will come after me and use exactly the same high contact surfaces. So elevator bottoms, held rails, door knobs, uh, faucets in bathrooms, and many other surfaces in the hospitals are what we call high contact surfaces and are very likely to be contaminated with MRSA. By the time that, pe that person comes back to clean and disinfect the bottom, how many people have gone through? So it is impossible, really, to keep completely free of these hospital-acquired pathogens in these type of environments. Then the message is, if the hospitals or the healthcare facilities are doing the best they can to keep the contamination low, you still know that you're working into a high-risk environment. Then you need to take responsibility of your own protection. And how you do that? Well, I normally do three things. Number one, I use different part of anatomical parts of my body to use the elevator bottoms, my knuckles, the back of my hands, the elbows, and then you're very flexible, your knees. <laughs> and the things like that is, those are parts of your body that you normally would not touch your nose or your mouth. So even if they get contaminated, and you don't have the chance to wash it or your alcohol gels, you're not going to be touching a place in your face that will transmit the infection or the pathogen to you. So that's number one. Number two, I will emphasize on that is, Wash your hands. CDC bombard us with that because it's true. It's the number one way to prevent yourself to become uh, colonized. Remember, MERS is bad. You don't want to be colonized and it's out there. Then do the work. Wash your hands. But my main message for action today is very much my colleagues all the time tell me that sometimes they don't have the time and the students to really wash their hands as they're supposed to be. So what can you do? Alcohol gel hand sanitizers. They really work in maintaining your contamination low, and if you maintain your hands contamination low, your chances of getting colonized also decrease. However, the only way that it works is if you do it properly. And what do I mean with properly? There are three rules you have to follow to maintain your hands free, or the alcohol to work. Number one, your hands have to be clean, visually clean. I know it sounds a little bit funny, but if you finish your Doritos, your French fries, your burger, and you have such a trouble in the place, it's not going to work. Why? Because the alcohol needs something that is called direct contact. That's the technical term for that. The alcohol molecule needs to get in contact with the cell wall of the staff to damage enough to kill it so your contamination in your hands is lower, and then that way your risk of colonization to decrease. But if you have layers of dirt in there, for veterinarians, it will be feces, saliva, or hairs, or whatever. The alcohol will never get in direct contact with the bacteria and will never kill it. Then you are not doing the job. If they are visually dirty, wash it and use alcohol gel. But it's like now, they look fine. The alcohol will do the work. That's number one. Number two, volume. The technical name here is volume. You need the right amount of alcohol gel. Normally, we scientists talk about three to five mLs. Well, you're not going to measure the amount that you use when you use these machines or your own bottle. So what is the rule of thumb? Very simple. You put enough amount that when you do this exercise, every surface of your skins in your hands are going to be completely moist or wet by the alcohol gel. If you do that, you're putting the right volume, no matter how big or small your hands are, okay? And the last one is very important. How many times have you seen your doctor, somebody put the alcohol gel, they do properly, and then they do this? <laughs> okay, the back of their pants, or like in the case of the pictures, they get a napkins and take it out. That goes against the third principle that is contact time. 
for the alcohol to be able to produce enough damage in the staff, the alcohol needs to be in direct contact with the bacteria between 30 seconds to a minute. Less than that, you're not doing anything. So that's the minimum. They are designed for them to evaporate more or less in that time. So what do you do with the rule of thumb? Very simple. You put enough amount, and then you let it dry. You talk about why the Bukai football team didn't make it to the national championship last year, and that would take definitely more than a minute. <laughs> and then after that, you go ahead and you take care of the patient. So the message is very simple. If you are in these one high-risk environments that we have done research on, you have to do three things. Be aware of what you touch and how you touch your face. Be sure that you wash your hands regularly and in between properly use alcohol gel. And if you do that, even if you are in a high-risk environment where you know that the enemy is out there, you will not let them in. Thank you very much. <laughs>